Right. Um, so today I'm going to talk about divergence time estimation, and like, so it's going to be a full day of doing this sort of thing. We have two tutorials, um, and so hmm, that usually works. This might be one of those times where my USB is not happy. Anyway. Um, so today, this is just the outline for today, um, and I'll, I'll post these slides to you after, um, after this first morning part. So um, what we're going to do is just broke it up into pieces, even though these are sort of the models that I'll be talking about, like sort of fully integrated uh, with one another. But what, what we're going to do is first talk about the clock models uh, and like sort of the basics of divergence time estimation. And then uh, we'll do a tutorial on that. Um, and then we'll do, uh, I'll talk more in depth about these sort of total evidence approaches in this fossilized birth death model. Um, so, and we'll apply this to a, a data set in, a, in the practical. Um, and I guess several or a few of you are working on infectious diseases and things like that. And so, you know, even though I'm not going to, we don't have a tutorial on that specifically, there's actually quite a lot of uh, overlap in this total evidence approaches with what you might do with, you know, uh, rapidly evolving infectious disease data, you know, when you have serial samples, um, and uh, you know, where there's a lot of uh, analogy to those models and those applications. So if for people are interested in that, um, I can talk about it um, in more detail um, as well, but um, we don't have actually a tutorial on that one. Um, Anyway, so today I'm going to start with just talking about sort of like general things about divergence time estimation. And so, you know, one of the things that most of us who are evolutionary biologists sort of realize is that, that phylogenies with branch lakes in proportion to evolutionary time to absolute evolutionary time, um, you know, give us a lot of information about evolutionary history and the, you know, the sort of processes by which we might get certain characters, certain traits, or certain distributions of organisms and the diversity that we see. And so this is, this is a, a picture of the, very f the only figure in the, in the Origin of Species by Charles Darwin, and it's of a time tree. So you know, this, you know, even Darwin was thinking about sort of the real importance of, of conceptualizing phylogeny on, in this context of time. Um, and so there's a first edition Origin of Species at Grinnell College in Iowa, and they actually let me touch it with my bare hands, so <laughs> which is apparently a normal thing in, in antique books. But um, for a long time, we've actually been quite good at estimating um, phylogenetic relationships um, you know, in, you know, in this unrooted, unconstrained context. And so in, in trees like this, what we're getting is, is branch lengths in proportion to the the number of substitutions per site, and so you know this allows us to give get some idea of how organisms are related and sort of their genetic divergence or things like that. But ultimately, as an evolutionary biologist, we'd rather have uh, you know rooted phylogenies with the branch lengths proportion to, proportional to the absolute time. So this is the time uh, in the context of geological years or like you know geological time years or millions of years and so on. So this is what we would prefer as evolutionary biologists when we're actually looking at trees and, and, and thinking about phylogeny. So, um, you know, that's sort of the context and like, you know, the motivation for what we might do uh, with these types of trees. So in order to get a tree with, uh, on an absolute time scale or on any type of time scale, what we would we, we have to make a lot of assumptions. And one, one thing that we can do is we can assume that um, all the evolutionary change is constant over time. And so here we have the concept of the global molecular clock. And what we're assuming is that branch lengths are equal to, you know, here in this tree, the branch lengths are equal to the percent sequence divergence. And if we make this assumption that um, uh, the rates of evolution are constant over time, then we can, we can get a really good sense of being able to date the tree or even understand the uh, sort of relative divergence times of within a tree. So if we make this assumption, then we can, uh, you know, we might be able to, if happen to know that the rate of evolution in this tree is 1% divergence per 10 million years. And given that we have make that assumption, then we can 
uh, date the nodes in this tree. So with these two things, uh, a known substitution rate and this assumption of constant uh, 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 rates of substitution, then we can date the nodes in the tree. So that, that makes things very easy. Alternatively, if we don't know the substitution rate, but we happen to find a fossil that represents the most recent common ancestor of two taxa in our tree, so in this tree, A, uh, B, and C, then if we have that, if we continue to make this constant rate assumption, and we know the age of this internal node, then we can date the node, uh, the root of this tree. So here we have these, these concepts of you know, making an assumption about how substitution rates tick over time, um, and then having some way of like, you know, understanding how, what that time is or, or making a statement about like the, that time either by calibrating with a fossil or calibrating with a rate. Um, and so unfortunately, this, con the, this assumption of this global molecular clock doesn't really hold for a lot of uh, biological data. And that's because you know, this, what we're making this assumption with the molecular clock is that the substitution rate is constant over time. And the issue here is that the substitution rate is really made up of a lot of different things. So the substitution rate is composed of both the mutation rate and the fixation rate. And so if you have variation or variability in any of the processes that make up the mutation rate or the substitution rate, then you will have variation in rates of substitution across the tree or over time. So if you have variation in things like metabolic rate or DNA repair or in the strengths and target of selection, then you will have uh, variation in, in rates of substitution. And so this is what, what leads to us often rejecting this hypothesis of the strict global molecular clock. Regardless, like even if we don't have this molecular clock assumption and we don't have the, the uh, approaches to understand rates of uh, um, or branch likes in proportion to time, we still get a lot of information from the sequences about the, you know, the branch lengths when we think about them in, in terms of substitutions per site. And so much of our work, uh, you know, for a long time in systematics has been to estimate trees in this context that's unconstrained where we're not making any assumptions about rates and times. And so this gives us the branch lengths, like I mentioned before, where the units are substitutions per site. And so the sequence data actually have quite a lot of information for the branch lengths in proportions to these substitutions per site. And the branch length in this context, what, what this means, these units are, it's really a product of the rate of substitution on a branch and the time duration of that branch. You know, and ultimately, that's where our information is coming from the, the sequences. And so you know, what this sort of leads to is that what we see here in the branch lengths is that we have this compound parameter. So, the branch length is a product of two parameters that we're actually quite interested in as evolutionary biologists. And the issue is, is that we might, if we're you know, calculating you know, the likelihood of our tree with a set of branch lengths, or say we have one branch length and we, have the, we compute the likelihood of that, of that branch length, then the optimal branch length might be you know, 0.5. We can think of, we can have you know, an infinite combination of rate and time that would equal 0.5. And this is what leads to this being kind of a tricky problem is that we have these com this compound param parameter and the two things that we're most interested in are confounded uh, into a single parameter. And so that's why when we're interested in estimating thing these things, we actually have to you know, separately estimate the rate of a, on a, the rate, substitution rate of a branch and the time duration of that branch. And so this is a, a figure from Mario Dos Reis' paper, uh, a review paper in, in Nature in 2016. And so he illustrates the same sort of figure uh, in, in this way. So if we take a Bayesian perspective here, what we want to do is separate these two parameters so that we have you know, some, uh, we're estimating our rate parameter and our substitution our, our substitution rate parameter and our time duration parameter as separate things. So, here in, in the first part of this figure, um, he has the substitution rate on the y-axis and the time of the branch on the, on the x-axis. And what these heat uh, sort of graphs are showing is that you know, our, our prior, we're going to put a prior probability on some value uh, 
for this branch, some value of the rate of the branch and some value of the time duration of that branch. And so here we have higher probability where, the, where it's very red uh, over some a specific time duration for that branch and some probability for the rate of that branch. The likelihood when we compute the probability of our data, our sequence data given that branch length, that actually has the highest likelihood over this like ridge where we have this sort of infin infinite combination given that we have you know, some combination of rate and time is going to always give us that branch length that is, is, has high likelihood, right? But when we take these two things in combination, we end up focusing our probability on one part of that parameter space. So this is going to allow us to, to you know, the combination of our prior on our substitution rate and our prior on that time duration of that branch with the information from the data is going to concentrate our probability uh, in the place that is like you know, the posterior probability of that branch uh, time and that branch rate. Does that, does that seem pretty clear to everybody? So what we ultimately have to do is construct these priors that give us uh, a separate prior on these two parameters for every branch. So here's this, this sort of broken down is that we have our branch, here's a tree where the branch lengths are in proportionate to the rate times the time, so this is the branch length. Um, and that in order to, to tease these apart, we have to have a model for the uh, rates at each branch and the time duration of each branch. So we have to have these as separate components of our model. And so if we think about this in a Bayesian context, what we are interested in is, is the rate. So here I'm going to show this uh, parameters on the tree. So this is a, a vector uh, R that represents the rate substitution rate on each branch. And this is a vector A that represents the ages of each of the internal nodes. So if we're going to uh, um, estimate these, what we want to do is have a rate on each branch and an age at each internal node. And so given that we have these ages uh, at the internal nodes, then we can actually compute the, the time duration of that branch, right? It's just subtracting the time of, the, of a daughter node from its parent. And so these are ultimately the parameters that we're setting up our models to describe. Um, so we'll have a model that, that describes how the rate parameters are distributed across the tree and how, what the distribution of speciation events in time is uh, how that happens. And so when we're thinking about this in a Bayesian framework, what we want is to have a posterior probability that describes what is the probability of our set of rates, our set of node ages, all of the parameters that are associated uh, with the, our priors on the rates and our priors on the ages, as well as our prior on the uh, sequence model. So the sequence data and how those are, uh, which would be like your GTR model or something like that. Um, and as well as our tree topology um, and divergence times. And so this is all conditional on our sequence data and maybe other data that we have in order to give us this time duration stuff. So when we break this apart, what we have is that we now have our uh, what the things that we're most interested in, in the context of this particular lecture, uh, is, is describing a prior distribution on the rates and a prior distribution on the node ages and, and divergence times. And, and ultimately, this is also the, the, the tree topology itself. Um, and so this is kind of what I'm going to focus on today. And so if we think about the, what we need in order to model these things, so the real you know, thing that I want to concentrate on, on are this priors for the rates and priors for the time. And so I'll start with just talking about these priors uh, or models for how we might describe substitution rate variation. And so what there's actually been, so I've mentioned the molecular clock already, and so, but there's also many other models that describe how we might have substitution rates um, distributed across the tree. Um, and so a lot of these are, that aren't the strict molecular clock are often called relaxed clock models, and so you'll hear that quite a lot too. And so these are just sort of some categories of these types of models that in terms of the way that I think about them and some citations for you. Um, and most of these citations are actually, I think all of them are in the tutorials, uh, or at least the total evidence one. 
Um, and so if we think about these individually, these categories, like we have what, what all of these models are really trying to do is you know, assign a rate parameter to each branch in the tree. And so the global molecular clock, what it is assuming is that every branch in the tree has the same substitution rate and that all lineages, and that this rate is constant over time. So you won't have major changes. There's no major changes in this rate parameters. And so if we think about this in a graphical model, what we can do is, is think, OK, then given that every, every branch has the same rate, then we have just one parameter, right? We only have to uh, create a stochastic node for that single parameter. So we'll cl call it the clock rate here. And if we want to estimate this, obviously, we have to put a prior on, on this parameter. And so here in this graphical model, I'm just showing you know, we'll have an exponential uh, prior with a rate parameter delta C. Um, and that describes the our uncertainty in the, in the clock rate, in the, the substitution rate of the tree. You know, and here's just a, a, maybe we have, for any state in our tree, we might have a single, you know, in our MCMC, we have a single sample of that value of that rate. So, I mean, so one thing, <laughs> I guess it's always really difficult to say what other people should choose as their prior. But, I mean, I think with certain things, like, so we know that the, a, a rate of substitution, it's a, it's a rate. So it has to be, uh, it's usually, well, it's going to be greater than zero. Um, and, and if what we know biologically, when we see things like substitution rates, and especially if we're es estimating absolute substitution rates, which would be, you know, say, the uh, number of substitutions per site per million years or something like that, then we would want, we would expect that it would be somewhat small. Um, and so uh, an exponential rate might be uh, pretty reasonable, or an exponential distribution might be pretty reasonable because it has such high probability at small values. But if, if, if it was a different type of parameter or uh, something else, maybe we actually have some prior belief or maybe from some other um, study or something like that on, on a different set of data that would give us some indication that maybe a, a gamma distribution describes our, our prior belief in that parameter better. So um, yeah, so an exponential is, is pretty reasonable for describing a parameter like the su substitution rate, but like it might not be always the best one to use. So it, it, the one thing with these types of problems and biology is that the, there's really no, I mean, there's so much of it is data set dependent, right? So that's always going to be kind of a tricky thing to deal with. But one of the things is that, you know, given that you have, if you have good models, like especially on the times, then, you know, you get a lot of information in the data for these. So. But we already, so we already discussed how the, the issues with the strict molecular clock. And, and in, in some cases, it might be quite reasonable to assume a molecular clock. And this is often done, say, for you know, some infectious diseases or, or things like that. And we're looking at, things, it, at organisms on a very closely related scale. But in the context of macroevolution, it doesn't usually you know, make a lot of sense. And so um, we have many people have described sort of extensions of this concept where they're relaxing the assumption of the strict molecular clock. And so this is where we then uh, allow the parameters to vary, the rate parameters to vary across the tree. And so probably the, the first re uh, relaxed clock model that was described is this concept of the local molecular clock. And, and, and this is a similar type of model that just simply assumes that the rates of substitution change fairly slowly over time and over the tree, uh, so that closely related lineages have uh, the same substitution rate. So you know, if we just pruned off this tree, we would then have a molecular clock. So here in these trees, all the branches represent the substitution rate. And so then you can see that where they're all the same length, they all have the same rate. So if we have a very you know, like slow rates of change, or, or slow rates of rates substitution change, then we'll have, uh, we'll, we might see something like this local molecular clock. Um, 
And so there's some really, uh, like the history behind this particular model is really interesting in that when it was first proposed, like you actually had to already have a priori define where those shifts were and how many there were and, and sort of even the magnitude of those. But so there was a paper in 2010 by Alexei Drummond and Mark Suchard where they introduced this uh, sort of a ran this concept of a random local clock. And so this model will allow you to uh, estimate every possible configuration of local molecular clocks in, in a tree. Um, and so this model is in RevBase as well, but it's, it's, it's kind of often can be a little bit difficult to mix over. Um, so really some of the most pioneering work in this, in the field of uh, relaxed clocks is, is some work done by uh, Jeff Thorne, uh, Hirohiso Kishino, and I um, actually don't know painter who, I don't know that person's first name actually, but, um, and, and their colleagues in various papers as well. And so this is uh, a model that assumes that you have this gradual change uh, in rates of substitution over time um, where closely related lineages have similar rates um, and so what the model functionally does is that, you know, whenever you have a node, so instead of modeling the rates at each branch, what this model is doing is modeling the rates at each node. And so whenever you have a speciation event, you draw, you would draw a new rate uh, from a log normal distribution where the mean is centered on the parent's rate. So then you have a variance parameter of that log normal distribution and given, you know, if, if you have very large variants, then you have very, very, a lot of variation in the um, rates of substitution. If you collapse that variance to zero, then you have a strict global clock. And if you, um, and if you have, say, a relatively, you know, small variance, then you'll have this really gradual change over the tree where, you know, here you have, you know, closely related lineages have really similar rates. And so this, this is a much more mechanistic concept of what, how we might have this substitution rate change over time because what it's assuming is that there's some biological process that is, is uh, you know, where you have a, essentially it's a geometric Brownian motion model of uh, rate change over time where, you know, there might be some biological like underlying process by which rate change happens. So there you would have closely related lineages having the same rate because it's the rate of change is heritable, but it's changing over time. Um, and this model is, is, although it's not commonly used because it's not available in uh, a lot of software like Beast, but uh, we, you can use this in, in RevBase. So another model that was uh, described in a paper by John and, and Brett Largett and Dave Swafford is this is a model that has sort of it's in a similar way to this autocorrelated rates model, it sort of mo rates change over time, but in a more punctuated fashion. And so this is also called a compound Poisson process model. But so here you actually have, uh, you can have rate change events along a branch. And that, you know, the, whenever you, and those occur according to a Poisson process. So, you know, given that you have a branch of some time duration, you might have uh, so, you know, a given number of rate shifts on that branch. Then uh, at any particular rate shift, you draw a new rate that's um, from a, a, well, you draw a multiplier for that rate and the multiplier is centered on one and you would then multiply the previous rate by that multiplier. So, you know, from one rate to the, after, the rate before a shift and after a shift can be very similar because, you know, depending on the, the, the distribution from which you draw that multiplier or the variance of that distribution from that multiplier. So this is you know, just a, conceptually a, a, an interesting model that allows for you know, sort of jumps in, potentially jumps in, in rate change where you can also you know, have some uh, you know, large number of rate shifts or large magnitudes of rate shifts. So no, they basically all occur along a branch. So then, and when you, so in order to, you know, if we want to compute like the, the probability of this, like in a, you know, or compute our, our likelihood, what we'll then do is, is take the weighted average of rates along a branch. 
So then um, the, another category of these rate models are these, it's a, essentially an infinite mixture model. Um, this was from a paper that I did with Mark Holder and John. And this is a concept where we, it's a phenomenological model where we actually vary the rates of substitution across the tree according to what's called the Dirichlet process. Um, and I won't go into the details of the Dirichlet process, uh, but essentially what this model assumes is that you have a set number, or you have a you have a uh, unknown number of, of rate cat substitution substitution rate categories, and that the branches themselves can be assigned to any one of these rate categories. Um, but under the model, we then have uh, the number of those rate ca categories is a is a random variable. The assignment of the branches to the those categories is also estimated uh, under that model and as well as the rate value for each of those categories. So um, this is it's a, a nice type of process that allows you to sort of you know, partition discrete elements into different um, uh, parameter classes. Um, and so this model is also applied to things like the substitution rate ac across an alignment, so rates of um, variation, uh, among site rate variation or, uh, or process variation in the model generally and um, programs like Phylobase that uses this and in, in there they call it the CAT model. Um, and here this is the same type of process but applied to rates across the, brain, uh, across the tree. Um, and so we, we have these models in, in RevBase as well. Yeah, so essentially it's this process is assuming that you have these like you know, unknown or hidden um, class assignments uh, in the, uh, among these elements, and the elements here are the branches, right? And so one of this, the things that comes out of this is it, it allows you to say, you know, if we're going to sample using MCMC using this, then we can you know, sample and uh, sort, of under, sort of estimate the assignment to these like, like unknown ca rate categories, you know, and how they might be partitioned potentially. So then this is the last uh, relaxed clock model I'll talk about, and probably mo many of you who've applied these types of methods before are quite familiar with these types of models. And this is also the, one of the models that you'll use in the tutorials today. Um, so this, uh, this other concept of, the, of relaxing the molecular clock assumption is, you know, allows us to assume that we have uh, uncorrelated or independent uh, branch rates for each uh, branch in our tree. And essentially, you know, here we're trying to estimate the rate for every branch in the tree. And what we're doing is just simply assuming that the rate for a given branch is drawn independently from some underlying distribution. So many of you, have, have, if you've used BEAST before, or even Mr. Bayes or Rev Bayes, uh, then you might have applied this type of a model before. Um, and so this is uh, in, in BEAST called the uncorrelated rates model. Um, and, and this is what most people often use when they're uh, doing uh, Bayesian divergence time estimation. And so here I'm just drawing a, a graphical model of the, of the uncorrelated rates model that's used in uh, BEAST very often. And so this is the uncorrelated log normal model. And here I have a plate. Uh, around the branches. So what we would do is make a vector of rates for every branch in our tree. And then we're going to assume that that rate is drawn independently from a, a log normal distribution. And so what BEAST, and what they do in BEAST and what is also quite practical to do, uh, you know, in RevBase is to use uh, a different parameterization of the log normal model. So the log normal distribution, you have two parameters this location parameter called mu and uh, a variance parameter called sigma. Um, but mu here does not actually, it's not actually the same as the mean of the distribution. And what it might be a lot more intuitive to place a prior on the mean of the mean branch rate rather than this location parameter of the log normal distribution. So in this case, what we would do is maybe Assume that the mean of the distribution comes from an exponential, so we'll have some exponential prior, and then we have some exponential prior on the um, on the substitute or on the variation of that or the sigma 
standard deviation parameter of that model. And then given that we have that, we can compute uh, using a deterministic function the location parameter of the log normal distribution. And so this is the sort of hierarchical model of that, um, of the log normal uncorrelated rates model. So that's this one, one thing that you could do. But I mean, like we were just talking about, like, you know, how do you decide and determine, you know, what type of underlying distribution you have? And that, that's actually one of the exercises you can do uh, in the tutorial. Um, because you can have some other option where you can say that maybe, maybe the rates come from an exponential distribution, but I don't actually know the rate, the, the parameterization of that exponential distribution, so maybe I think that also comes from an exponential distribution. So in the total evidence tutorial, we'll use this model, which assumes that, okay, every branch in the tree has its own rate, and that rate comes from an exponential distribution, and what we do is place another prior on the rate parameter of that exponential distribution, which is called a hyperprior, uh, to, because to describe our uncertainty in that parameter. So this is just still taking this concept of this hierarchical modeling uh, to you know, understand and estimate the parameters that, that we have uncertainty in. So this is just another uh, type of model. And so you can see how, you know, for these kinds of models, you can kind of you know, think about, oh, there's easily different ways to parameterize or, or define my prior distribution on these models, right? If I had a strict molecular clock, it could come from an exponential, it could come from a log normal or gamma distribution. Um, if under these uncorrelated models, we could do that too. An autocorrelated model could come from different distributions. So, you know, there's a lot of flexibility here. Um, one of the things you'll also, you know, realize is that the, it's really unlikely that that there's a one-size-fits-all to these types of models, too, right? Um, yeah? Clarify, where would this hyper fit into the model on the previous? So, on, so this is, if this would be if we deleted all this stuff up here, and then at, put this stuff here. Oh. So these are alternatives, yeah. So this one would be assuming this, uh, so here one would be assuming that the underlying distribution is a log normal, and the other would be un assuming that the underlying distribution is an exponential. Yeah. But yeah, so there's, there's quite, and you know, these are just, what I've shown are just a subset of what has been described or what you can even conceive, right? Like so, you know, there's a lot of ways in which you might be able to hypothesize how substitution rates vary across a tree. Um, and so this is uh, important conceptually because, you know, it, it then becomes, in, you know, critical to really understand, you know, the plausibility of these types of models given our data and, and use appropriate approaches to determine, like, if, if, a, if a model is a good fit or not. Um, and so what I was mentioning before, you know, you might not always have this situation where, where one model applies to all things. Like you can imagine that like, you know, in, in some types of data sets, say if you had um, a group of taxa that were very closely related, maybe those are more likely to have autocorrelated rates or uh, local molecular clock type rate distributions. You know, say if you had, in, like, like in the, in the examples that you'll do, like all the living species of bears, um, and bears are about you know 30 million years old. But then if you extend that and say, I'm going to estimate the divergence times of all metazoa, but I only have 70 taxa sampled across the distribution of that group, if, even if there was autocorrelated rates there, it might be very difficult to detect that given the type of sampling that you have. And so you would imagine that you might need more sampling in order to be able to get that. Uh, how do you use the right tools, uh, when kind of data? So, you know, <laughs> these, these types of things are, uh, like, one, first, if you actually have a strong prior understanding of what these rates are, then it make, and can justify that prior, it makes sense to use that prior. 
Um, alternatively, you know, you have a set of models that are available, right? And so you can do the same things that we talked about, you know, yesterday, like uh, do uh, model selection using Bayes factors to see, you know, what, which of the models have the highest support among your data. Um, and, or alternatively, you know, given that you've chosen a model, you can also say w how, how, uh, how adequate that model is. And if, if, you, if you build this type of a case for your analysis, then you can make a strong case to you know, people who are reading your papers and things like that. So one thing is, is that you know, a lot of you know, determining what a prior is has to come from some you know, pretty critical understanding of your biology as well, right? So you know, if you make these assumptions and can strongly justify them, I think you can convince a lot of people that that's the right thing to do. Um, you know, but you know, if, you, if you're choosing them at random or just because they're available, then you know, the next step to do would be to use these type of posterior predictive approaches or use model selection in order to, to make that decision. So this is where this part becomes pretty important. Um, so I think that's what I have for the relaxed clock stuff. Does anyone have any other questions on that? So there are really a lot of other models too, but and a lot of things you can do in Red Bays. Okay, so the next part of the whole divergence time estimation uh, paradigm is really to um, come up with a prior that describes how branch times and the tree topology are distributed. And so here uh, we need the relaxed clock models, but we also need uh, priors on the node ages or priors on the time tree that itself. And so you know, what we're trying to describe here is not just the topology of the tree, but also the distribution of branching times. Um, and these trees were all simulated under different uh, branching time models. And you can see that you have these different distributions given, you know, if you might uh, change the parameters of those models. You, know, you get different sort of shapes or distributions of, of speciation times. So I'm mostly just going to talk about one kind of model, or one sort of general class of model, and that's this stochastic branching process called the birth-death process. Um, and this is really, for anyone who's uh, done divergence time estimation methods before, you've probably applied a birth-death process. And what this simply does is assumes that you have uh, a, a, this branching process where you start with a single lineage at some point in time. Then after some amount of time, that lineage can either speciate and go extinct. And so for your taxa, it most likely speciated at some point because Otherwise, they wouldn't be here, right? So, um, if they so after some amount of time, it will go, you'll have a speciation event, um, and that over time you have speciation and extinction occurring at some rate. And so, the most general case that we have, or the most simple case that we have, is really where we have this constant rate of speciation and extinction over time, and we also account for the fact that we have some probability of sampling lineages in the present. So when you're, af like when you sample your taxa, you have, there's some probability that you'll sample a, a lineage or not. So here, what I'm showing is the graphical model for this process, and what we have is, it's conditional, so the, this T is representing the tree, the tree topology and divergence times, um, and this is conditional on uh, the speciation rate uh, the, ex the extinction rate, the origin time, so that what the origin time is the very start of the process, so that's the start of when you had a single lineage at any point in time, uh, and then the sampling probability. And so the sampling probability is the probability of sampling an, a, a lineage in the present. And so these are the, the basic parameters of this model. And so here's, these are the things that are really describing this process. And you can see that, you know, it might be really difficult to, you know, say what is exactly the speciation or extinction rate in our model. Um, and that's why we might put hyperpriors on, on these parameters. Um, likewise, the origin time, uh, you know, we might have some uniform distribution on that. 
And the nature of these birth death processes is that we, you do have quite a lot of correlation among the parameters, and it becomes quite difficult to estimate them if you ha unless you can, you know, say, put a strong prior on something on one of them. And so the sampling probability is might be something we have actually some good amount of information for. And so you know, you'll see in you know, if we if we you know, one of the examples I'll talk about today is, is, is an analysis we did for penguins, and we have sequenced every living species of penguin uh, the, in, that, in that data set. There's only 19, so we can easily say that the probability of sampling uh, a lineage in the present is one in this case. Um, but if you're working on, um, say, something like Nidaria, then you know you might have a much 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 lower sampling probability. So if you have an ability to put a strong prior on this parameter, then it's often very helpful. Um, so in the uh, in the first tutorial, we'll actually use a different parameterization of the birth death process, and and this is also the parameterization that they use in Beast. Um, and here, what w instead of saying specifying a, a prior on speciation and extinction. What we do instead is uh, assign a prior to the diversification rate and the turnover. And what the diversification rate is, is this is the net diversification, so that's the speciation minus extinction. And turnover is extinction divided by speciation. And often these might be parameters that are of interest, but one, another reason is that we often will uh, use these parameters specifically because uh, we may be able to construct more intuitive priors for them than we would speciation and extinction. And that's because a lot of times, uh, and they do this in beasts particularly, is restrict turnover to be um, between zero and one. So this means extinction is never higher than speciation. Um, and this might not necessarily be true, uh, and most paleontologists would argue that it is very rarely true. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, in order, especially particularly when you have all extant taxa, um, and you don't allow, and you do allow extinction to um, be higher than speciation, you end up having a lot of problems in the terms of the probability of the birth death process. So, you know, we we use this as sort of a convenience, and and uh, um, and it's it's also makes things a lot more stable, but. Uh, you'll see in the second tutorial today that we'll actually uh, just put priors on speciation and extinction, and um, this will then allow um, for the diversification rate to be negative or the uh, turnover to be higher than one. Um, but this is just simply the, the equations that we are able to get speciation and extinction from diversification and turnover. So is, does, do these uh, models make sense to everyone? So the, uh, the evidence that your extinction rate actually is higher than your diversification rate based on fossil record, you would modify your prior to make that trade-off? Yeah, so I mean, I guess the thing is, is if those fossils aren't in your data set, you might have a lot of, if those fossils aren't in your analysis, this might be problematic. Um, but if they are, then, there's actually so, and I won't go into these in a lot of detail, well, in any detail really today. I don't think I made slides. But there are some models where we're, we're able to vary the speciation and extinction over time. So, you know, if we consider the time duration of our process and we break that up into piecewise intervals, then we can vary those speciation and extinction in those intervals. And there it becomes, it, it's not a problematic to have extinction higher than speciation. And, and if we have fossils sampled, um, often then it's not as much of a problem either. But it does become problematic. If you have extinction much, much higher than speciation, then the probability of having any extant taxa becomes zero. And then, then you have a, a lot of issues when you're actually doing MCMC on a model like that. But that's, that's just kind of where that is. But if you do have a, a good fossil record, then obviously it makes sense to include those in your analysis. Uh, and there's various ways we can do that, and I'll talk about that in the latter part of today. <laughs>
Uh, it really depends. Like, so one thing is, is that, you know, there's, in some cases, say your divergence time estimates might be fairly robust to this. If you have, you know, really a lot of, like, or a really good prior on your substitution rate. But because you have this interacting parameters of this rate and time, you know, it, it really matters the choices that you make for these priors on these various components. So um, I guess it's really hard to say there's like really no logical rule of thumb outcome of what would happen if, you know, depending on what choices you make. But, you know, in a lot of cases, like what you'll see is like if there are particular strong violations in the model in your data, like say, you know, the way you, if you don't describe, say, how, per, especially how you sample this tips in uh, the present. So um, there are a lot of variations on these birth death processes. So one of the sampling assumptions that we make is that we sample the taxa in the present at random. But if we actually sample them, say, by genus, and we assume that they're sampled by random, then we can bias our estimates of divergence times and other things. And so Sebastian has a paper on this too. So there's a lot of these things that can happen that could make these issues problematic. And I'll talk about more of, of, of those in a little bit too. Yeah, so there's, like, that's a that's a, a whole other issue. So there's there's a couple things that that I think you can do for in those cases, and this is some things that we're working on too. Is one in one case, um, what you can assume is that like your last time of your sample is the present, right. um, and so then you know, you have some of these things. But in in those cases, I think have especially for like say the data that you would have. I would say these skyline type of models would be the most appropriate. So then you can have these situations where, and that might also be what you're mostly interested in anyway. And so um, these situations where like in certain intervals you have higher speciation and extinction or vice versa. Um, and so that would be an uh, appropriate thing to do. And so the, the second tutorial, you know, what we have is that we just have a prior on speciation and prior on, on extinction. And, and it's, you know, it's pretty stable in that in that data set. But there are data sets that I've applied things to where it's just like you know you, you get extinction rate. You just happen to sample it too high, and and, and things become a problem. But um, yeah, so there's there's some issues like that. There's the other cases that when you have data sets of fully e extinct things where you might only have one sample in like that is your most recent one. And in those cases, like the, the consideration of this parameter is really weird. And so you know, either rho is one or rho is zero, and, and it really kind of depends on the type of model you're using. Um, yeah, and that's some that's the thing of, that we've discussed at length on the, about these models. So yeah. But the, the birth death processes are, are fascinating and weird. And like, um, if you do a lot with them, they can keep you up at night a little bit. <laughs> so um, getting some intuition for how they're constructed and the parameters involved is, is always good. But you know, if, if you find them confusing, you're not alone. And uh, so like, we'll, there will be a lot more discussion of these things later on. OK. Cool. So essentially, and this uh, kind of gets it, it, the previous question is that you know, these different values of, of speciation and extinction will lead to really different uh, shapes of trees or uh, tree topologies um, or distributions of fossils. And that's where, you know, these approaches to, you know, evaluating the validity of a model uh, and understanding those concepts will become really, really important. Um, and so uh, taking these into account will be uh, really good, and then as well as like putting hyper priors on these on these things, it's going to be really difficult to you know uh, for a lot of data sets to say you know what is a speciation rate or what is a diversification rate, and that's why we then also have to estimate these. And and I think one thing that we still need to really understand in the field is 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 looking at a lot of sensitivity to prior assumptions or model adequacy and and the approaches for doing these posterior predictive methods on birth death processes is still kind of not fully developed as well. So 
um, there's a lot of room there for that. So is, are there any more questions? I wanted to give a lot of time for tutorials today just because these things are pretty weird. <laughs> um, and so since this is, uh, that's kind of what I had for the first, that would cover a lot of what you're going to do in the first part. Um, then we can actually start the tutorial early. Um, yeah. So you'll hear about those on Friday, right? Um, yeah. So, I mean, I can talk a little bit just, you know, about this type of thing. So, you know, versus a coalescent, it's like, you know, in, in this context, what we're really doing is like thinking about like a, a lineage uh, process of evolution, whereas a coalescent is more of a population level um, process. And, you know, if you're, if you're dealing with things that are like, say, uh, infectious diseases that are evolving very rapidly, so these birth death models are applied frequently to uh, things like HIV and Ebola and like, you know, fast evolving uh, retrovirus viruses and stuff like that. Um, you know, in other cases, like, you know, people who are working on infectious disease are using coalescent-based approaches. Yeah, so the, I mean, the, the birth death process is actually kind of a, a nice process that describes a lot of, you know, sort of this type of cladogenesis or branching or whatever, you know, where you have things like coming on and going off. Um, whereas the coalescent, like, you know, in, in how it's mostly applied is really in the context of this, um, population level questions. But where they come together too is, is what Best Gen will talk about uh, in terms of these like gene tree species tree approaches and this multi-species coalescent. And uh, you know, so then you have a species tree that is coming from some birth death process. You know, potentially also some uh, locust tree or gene family tree that has, is, has a birth death process. And then the coalescent process of the genes that evolve on those loci. Um, yeah, so it, like there is like a real gradient between these things. The way that we kind of address them in, in practice is, is considers them like sort of two separate things, but they're probably not. But there are coalescent uh, models in RevBase.